Hello, and welcome to the Trail and Adventure Motorbike Podcast, with me, Clive Barber, and my good mate, Noel Tom. For the days when you can't ride your bike, there's always the Trail and Adventure Motorbike Podcast. Hello, everybody. We're back, and today we're back with Grant White, who is the co-founder of a charity called Future Terrain, futureterrain.co.uk. Grant is a massively inspirational listener turned friend who has turned his lack of leg into a huge positive to help others who have similar and worse difficulties. I've deliberately not used the word disabled because if you met Grant, disabled is the last thing that would occur to you. Grant's charity, Future Terrain, organises and funds adventures and expeditions to help vets that are struggling one way or another through training, qualifications and taking them on excellent adventures. I think you're going to enjoy this one. A massively impressive character. Let's get on with it. We were just talking about the Rydell Rally, Noel. Noel has done one in the past, but I mean, it was really hot, wasn't it? And I was absolutely knackered at the end of it. First of all, big thanks to you, Clive, for first of all, let me join you on that and also <laughs> nursing me through it. Um, first day was devastated by the end of it. Yeah, I was absolutely shattered. I had really bad cramp in my um, big thigh muscle. I've never experienced pain like it. I just had an MRI scan on my shoulder because I, I came off on that first day and I was really sore. Yeah, I've got a longitudinal tear in my AC joint and stuff. I'm like, I can't believe it. Yeah, I've just been hobbling around ever since. Why was it more tiring than a, than a general trail ride? Was it faster and longer? Faster and longer. And then you got the time sections that were quite horrible and rutty. But we got to the second day. We did, um, I think there was three laps on the second day. We did one lap. Got to the end of the time section, and Grant went, "Yeah, I think I've had enough." I went, "Yeah, me too. I'm coming with. I'll, I'll, don't worry, I'll, I'll look after you." Back to the um... nurse me back to the coffee and cake shop. <laughs> no, I was very grateful for that. I was. Uh... I probably would have finished it, but fucking hell, I'm glad you <laughs> gave me this. Yeah. Well, the way my shoulder is now, I, I would have write myself a ride off. Yeah. So yeah, I did my a a C thing in Morocco. Yeah, Morocco, but I just ripped it straight off. Oh, wow. No, 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 nothing like that. Apparently, It's just a tear down the middle, apparently. Painful business. What does it feel like? Because I think I might have done that, but I haven't sought out Western medicine. It hurts. Does it feel like you've broken something or does it feel muscular? Yeah, it feels like you've broken something. I feel like a, a, an healing bone at the moment. Well, because mine came completely off. I had like a little sticky up bone there. I'm sure I've told the story before, but it was like four hours to the nearest hospital. And then when we got the hospital, it was closed. So they had to ring a doctor up to come in. And then they x-rayed it on this really old Bakelite enameled. Soviet Union. Exactly. Yeah. Wall. And he went, I, it's fine, nothing's broken. And I'm thinking, are you fucking joking? There's a fucking bone sticking up there. That was our Morocco story with a guy who broke 11 ribs. Oh. And they stuck him through it and they said, no, you're fine. Similar experience for another mate of mine, broke his femur. Or cracked his femur, and they went, "No, you're fine." And the guide wouldn't even let him buy a walking. Yeah, you know, they're trying to whip you off for those crutches. I'll make you a walking stick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you had a chance to look at those things I sent you, Noel. I did, and I realised that I saw Grant's television appearance when it came out. It was probably was it like 2022, or was it earlier than that? Yeah, it would have been April 22, I think, when the program came out. Because we did the filming in September 21. Can I just ask a very silly question before we get into this that? This is what so, you're here for. This is what you do. You were on Speed Shop. Titch, to his credit, got that onto the BBC. I, I'd love to know how he did that, but that's for another time. But I always wonder, when you appear in something that's on the BBC, that night it went out, do you all like? Do you get loads of people around to the house? Do you watch it? Is it a big deal the night it goes out, or were you just out doing something else? No, I did watch it, but it was me on my own. Wife was pretty indifferent to it all. And, really? Uh, and the kids had gone to bed, and then we watched it on iPlayer. It was only because I think all our family and friends' WhatsApp groups started to flare up going, have I just seen Grant on TV? I just always think it must be mind-blowing when you go out on the BBC. You know, it's not just dribbled out on YouTube for someone to see at their leisure. It's on the BBC on a Sunday night. You know, you just know there's squillions of people watching it. It must be a quite a mind-blowing thing. Titch is a friend as well, so we were so much cheering him on to, for the programme. Um, so hopefully it was going to be a success, you know. I'd have had a massive big watch party hired like the Albert Hall or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I'm really happy to be chatting to a podcast listener term friend, Grant, who I met at the ABR this year or two years ago. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, both. this year, yeah. And then you were in the Team Tam podcast at the Rydale Rally, which we kind of rode around together. So I'm delighted to welcome Grant White to the podcast. Grant, tell us who you are and tell us a little bit about your charity. First of all, thanks for inviting me on. It was a, it was a great opportunity and I've loved the podcast pretty much since you first started. Grant White, I think I fit the similar mould to you guys and probably some of your listeners. You know, I'm a 50-something motorbike rider, trail rider, like the adventure bike riding, been into bikes all my life. My favourite bike is the bike that I'm riding, whatever that may be. Obviously, recently, we were on the TAM podcast team for the Rydale Rally. And during that, we spoke about some of the stuff I've been doing from a, a charity perspective. So about eight years ago, I founded a charity called Future Terrain. It's a military rehabilitation charity. The idea is to take people that are wounded, injured, sick, either currently serving or veterans. And we take them on challenging motorized experts and more recently we've got a lot of motorbikes involved we were very car heavy to start off with but the idea being to take people challenge their disability hopefully try to get them back into a, a team environment or a challenging environment and without challenging them too much without breaking them but at least getting them to push the limits a little bit and that's in general terms what the charity is about but it has evolved over the years i say we started off as an off-road motor racing charity and then morphed into expeditions because we think they fit our profile better you sounded like you used a bit of a, a military abbreviation then exped expedition yeah so i'll clear that up it's a grand term you guys go on exped's all the time a two-day green laning trips an exped right it just happens to be in the uk we've done morocco a few times we've done the pyrenees last year we a, a good one love the Pyrenees I think it, bang for buck is a really good expedition and obviously Morocco is just out of this world for, for its, the, the landscape isolation but with that comes challenges as we I think we spoke about earlier about four hour trips to a and that must have been a local hospital if it was four hours away you mentioned you've been riding all your life tell us a bit about your riding history I'm going to make everybody jealous now so I started about 14 years old and I bought an old Pedal start, rally run around off a friend of mine without my, my parents knowing. We used to have a, a terraced, classic two up, two down terraced house, but they had those amazingly long cricket pitch style gardens, which I used to thrash up and down on. And that was the start of my uh, illustrious motorcycle career. Then I joined the Marines, really got into bikes in my early 20s, got my license. I remember desperate to get a bike. And then the only place I could get a, a test was in Plymouth. So I rode all the way to Plymouth from the Midlands on a, a rented MZ125, the old one with the ugly tank to get the only slot to do a test, came back and then jumped onto a GPZ550 that I'd bought. Did all the old GSs in that era and of that age. So GS1000 Katana, still got one of the best Speedos on any bike ever seen. What's so great about the Speedo on that bike? It's the way the revs and the Speedo, the, the hands go the wrong way from each other. They separate. And I just always loved it. And I always thought that the new Katana Mr. Beat there where they've got that did TFT display, which means you could have anything on it. They could have replicated that old clock. And I've always been a fan of that bike. It was a bulletproof engine, GS1000. And then I had a bit of a break again. Usually through military, you tend to go away on operations and bits and pieces. And I fell in love with the Aprilia RS250. I remember everybody was buying 916s. Everyone had GSX6, JSXR 750s. And I bought this Aprilia RS250, which was a work of art. And um, did it up. It was quick as you like. The one thing I'll always remember is everyone, the people that had the 916s and the 750s always used to say, why did you buy 250? But they were always the ones who were asking me if they could have a go on my bike. It was never me asking to have a go on theirs. But unfortunately, that's my my biking career came to a bit of a gap. I mentioned I was in the military, I was in the Marines, and I went to see a friend on the Marine base, and I was actually going to get my bike shipped out to Northern Ireland. I was doing some work in Northern Ireland, and uh, I was able to take my motorcycle out to go and ride at Knock Corner. The van didn't turn up that day, so I was just pootling home, and I was involved in the hit and run. So it forced me off the road into a, a telegraph pole, which shattered my right leg. How old were you then? I would have been 30, 31. It was the day after Lady Diana died, so on the Monday. I always remember that because the, the day before we had a barbecue, because I'd been away, and, and everyone, I couldn't get over this mass national mourning. I didn't, couldn't get my head around it, and I did this big drunken speech at my barbecue about the people here, the people I care about, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then next day, properly spanked in. People to this day think I did it on purpose just to prove a point. <laughs> Ever the optimist, I thought, oh, I've broken a leg. But just as I was going into surgery, the doctor said, oh, I think we can save it. And that was like, oh, okay. Woke up, they did save it. 
but I was about two years without being able to wait there on crutches. And then it was about four years before I got back to military fitness and never rode a bike during that time because of the injury. And, and I was just busy trying to get back to walking properly and trying to get back to a level of military fitness. After about four years, I'd say I, I did that and uh, I was pretty back back to full fitness again. But then the, my ankle joint as associated with the injury started to deteriorate to a point where I just had enough. And I said, like, no, this is time to get rid of the limb. Not, you know, because of pain that I was in and also because uh, it was stopping me doing things. And ironically, having that limb removed was the catalyst to get back onto bikes again. My mother had a terrible car accident and she has kept her foot, but she's often said, I wish they'd just removed it, which always shocked me to hear her say that. But was that decision very easy to make for you? Was it very clear cut? It was because I'd had years and years of uh, discomfort. And, and if you've got an appendicitis, you don't worry about taking away your appendix. It's not doing you any good anymore and it's causing you discomfort. Obviously, it could be fatal, but I've done this with a few people now. I've, I've mentored quite a few people before they've had a limb removed. And I told them that, you know, I had an easy journey, but I give them the warts and all story of going through the process. But it's a very personal decision. And to me, it was a defective limb. And there was no body dysmorphia or anything like that. It was just, I cannot, I'm fed up again in the morning, stiff, tired, can't walk, can't run, all the things I used to love doing. And yeah, it's a very pragmatic decision. You know, people say, oh, it must have been very brave. No, it wasn't. It was just a simple pragmatic decision. I remember going into Celio Hospital the night before. I asked, can I go for a walk? And it wasn't because I wanted to have a last final walk. It was because I wanted to go and get a Chinese. <laughs> the next day, it was a sense of relief. So there's an end of an injury chapter. And it's like, now I'm, I'm, I'm opening up a new chapter to, to go to the next phase, if you like, wherever that was going to take me. And at that point, I think my wife was coming to visit me the first time and she said, do you want me to bring anything in? And I don't know why. I just said, can you bring me a copy of the Motorcycle News in? And I hadn't read the Motorcycle News for about 10 years. Whenever the long way round was was launched, I think someone bought me the box set for Christmas and I'd been an amputee for three months, I think. Watched over Christmas period, watched a long way round. And I think two months later, inspired by the GS I bought a KTM 990 and then that sort of started my adventure bike riding and trail riding uh, path really. I think if I'd have been your wife and you'd asked me to bring you in an MC and I'd have told you, you've got to be fucking kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she really thought much of it at the time. When we first met and I was over the injury, I had this horrendously mutilated leg that didn't look very nice in shorts. We spent two weeks touring California on a Harley, you know, so she sort of knew I was into bikes. I don't think I'd owned a bike since we'd been married or in the time we'd known each other. So I think she just thought, oh, it's just, you know, he's in, he, you know, he's got a passing interest in bikes and they had to play the long game. But when I consider it was probably about five months from amputation to buying a KTM 990. And I can remember having more long conversations because my son was only a couple of years old then, you know, these conversations about you've got to actively discourage your son from riding motorcycles, you know, and, and I was going, I can't do that because it's the thing I'm passionate about. And lo and behold, he was at the ABR festival this year, the fastest man on a TW125 <laughs> going around the ABR <laughs> trails, you know. I've got three boys and my, my youngest were doing their Duke of Edinburgh and part of their skills was we did motorcycle maintenance. So we stripped down an old M50 and, and my DRZ, my beloved DRZ 400, we did all the bearing changes and we did all all that kind of stuff. If you're like me, my parents would have that ilk. You know, if you bring a motorbike home, I'll back my car over it and all the rest of it. It just makes you want to do it more. <laughs> and it's only my oldest has really embraced it, but he just likes riding dirt and trails. That's what, he just wants to do the trail riding. And he's, you know, he can't wait to get his license. He wants a DLZ 400 like me. And, you know, I can't wait for him to do it. We've got a Facebook page, Young Trail Riders. Tell him to join that and he'll meet some like-minded youngsters. I will definitely do that, yeah. You kind of answered the question, I think, but did the accident put you off? It didn't put me off. I didn't buy one and that was really down to circumstances. I had a very sort of uh, busy operational military life so it's, there's no time to buy a bike and have it lying in around a flat under a cover and not being used. I do clearly remember the first time I jumped on a bike after the accident. I can remember thinking every junction every car was just going to ram me into a lamppost. And I thought, is this some delayed onset of PTSD? And it wasn't. By the time I'd ridden for 30 minutes, I'd forgot all about that. It, that was the only worrying bit. I remember the first car that came up to the first junction, I just thought, he's just going to speed out and ram me into the next lamppost. Um, and he didn't, because people tend not to do that. What's in the garage now? Oh, God, busy garage at the moment. There's a Husqvarna FE350. That's not mine. That's a friend of mine. We've adventurized it, so we brought it around with a safari tank, 
AS screen on it, Garmin up. That's a work of art, that is. That was Jake. You met Jake at the Rydale Rally who came along to help me out. Then you've got my trusty DRZ 400S. Trusty, you say? Trusty? Yeah, yeah, I'll get, get on to that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that thing. My son's TW125, getting ready to change some pistons. KTM 690 Enduro, but none like anything you've ever seen because over lockdown, inspired by Roland Sands project, I decided to strip it completely down and built a custom, full custom KTM 690 with a hand-built, a friend of mine's a very talented fabricator. So we had handmade tank, steel tank. You sit on the tank on a 690, no longer put a subframe on it. It was meant to look like a 1990s Dakar bike. No lights, number board on the front, very, very minimalized. Everything's handmade on it. And that's sat in the garage. That's been a labor of love to a certain extent. I got hacked off with it almightily, but it looks pretty. It's martini race colours and things like that. And it's a it's a bar hopping bike, really. It's got knobblies on it and everything else. I wouldn't dare take it anywhere near mud. I keep meaning to try and get rid of it and sell it on, but I'll never get what it's worth. Or I keep justifying it in that by doing that in lockdown, stripping it down and rebuilding it, I learned a lot about motorcycle maintenance because I had to do everything myself. And I didn't care. I didn't care if I got it wrong. I put the cost of doing that to the bike as like my night school if you like on motorcycles so it's paid dividends so you, you don't have any plans for that bike other than as you say just riding it locally yeah just riding like, i had a lot of problems with fueling on it because the, the the tank that i had built it's got an internal fuel pump as most bikes do now that just was a nightmare trying to do it externally and i literally spent a year and a half two years trying to do something different only because i didn't want to cut a hole in this beautiful tank which i ended up doing and then it works perfectly i put it into a show this year but it's really just, I mean, it goes goes like a stabbed rat. It's got a, a shorty straight through exhaust. It's got a really breathable air filter on it. Not done a great deal to it, but the mapping is on the on the turbo nutter bastard setting. And it just, and, and it handles amazingly well. Managed not to screw up the geometry too much. And then don't hate me for this, but my latest purchase, I just bought an Indian Springfield cruiser. We were talking about cruisers at the weekend. No, let me stop you there. Should we... Sh- Share this with our audience. No one hears yeah. this. Yeah, we're all getting cruisers. First of all, na- <laughs> first of all, Noel's now got three GSs. <laughs> That's right, isn't it? Three. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So there's that, and then also we were talking at the weekend, and I was going, I quite like choppers. <laughs> <laughs> We were in a, a bike shop and we saw one on a ramp and it just, there's something, it's an itch yet to be scratched, isn't it? And I'm really scratching that itch at the moment because I can put my open face helmet on, throw a barber jacket on and just go out. As soon as it's sunny, the best thing about it is how many old men stop and smile at it. They tear up almost and they, I remember <laughs> that. That's the best thing around, about it. Like you say, it was an itch I wanted to scratch, and that's a permanent fixture now, I think, in the uh, in the garage. Other than that, what sort of riding do you do? Trail riding, adventure stuff? A trail adventure stuff, green laning. I'm up in Worcester at the moment, moved up to Worcester a couple of years ago, but Dorset was where I did most of my trail riding. The charity is based in Bovington, so we're, we're lucky enough that we are befriended by a reservist tank unit that allows me to put our container full of adventure kit and a couple of our vehicles there but we have access to the bonington training area so where they test tanks and that is just the best playground ever we do car training there we do four by four training atv training there for the beneficiaries but i always invite people like titch cormack come down graham billington we'll all go and have a play and there's sand dunes there's big hills there's you know enduro stuff soft sand mud water anything you need so that's an enclosed playing area we'll do theory and then we go on to the training area and we'll maybe camp out as well if we need to but everything you need if tanks can't break it little trail riding bikes aren't going to break it you know as much as we try one thing i did want to say grant having met you you are and forgive me i'll embarrass you now but i came away from that weekend being utterly fucking impressed with you as, as a person and the fact that you've lost your leg below the knee right yeah. on, on i can't remember if it's gear or brake yeah, side brake side, break yeah. side i think there was only once during that weekend of some fairly hard riding long days in mad here i think you only asked for help once when you were stuck under your bike <laughs> You're going, I could actually lift the bike up and get away, but I'm just a bit worried about my leg coming off. Yeah. yeah. 
that's the downside of don't get me wrong in the world i work in with supporting injured people it's a scratch a blown knee is a scratch I, i'd embarrass myself if i even mentioned it in front of some of the people that i've supported over the years and it's the best limb to lose if you're going to ride a motorbike because you've only got to worry about a back brake and most modifications you can do to bikes are pretty simple if you need to do them i would never modify the springfield for example because it's got a big trucker's brake that i can easily use and the, the off-road bikes i tend to modify somehow because it just it's a bit too technical but what tends to happen is if i'm going to fall over it'll always be on the right hand side and generally that's because the right leg's never going to be as quick as my left leg you don't have the same spatial awareness because your joints are little sensors that tell you where you are in space and i'm missing a load of those so when i'm falling over to the right i have to see the ground moving the other way before i realize i'm falling to the right so i'm a little bit slower when you get hot and sweaty my stump starts to piston in the in the cast and that means when you go to lift your foot off your pedal you lift your stump but your foot stays on the pedal so it, it catches and then you fall over to the right hence why i bash my right shoulder and then not invariably the leg comes off and then i'm stuck under the bike but that can be an advantage you know i found that in the pyrenees stuck in a river under the bike was it being able to take the leg off and climb from underneath it beats drowning i suppose it, it does yeah or drowning the engine so i was able to to get under, from underneath the bike by taking it off but i often forget when i'm out trail riding with new people that you know i don't make a point of saying by the way I've, i'm missing a leg but they soon find out when i as i'm going to do have a catastrophic fall off and my leg goes spinning through the air i've seen a few ashen faces where people <laughs> and in fact it happened on that weekend we were going through one of the marshy bits and uh, one of the guys stopped to help pick the bike up and said oh you just my legs come off you know and you get that double take you know but he was pretty cool about it waiting for me to put it back on and then crack on again can you describe what, what are the mechanics how is it attached to your stump there's various ways that they work my stump goes straight into a cast and i wear a liner that's got ribs on it so it basically gets pushed in, forces air out the bottom and creates suction to keep it on. And it depends on the individual, really. It depends on the activities you're doing. This is sort of an eye activity methodology. Some people will have a thicker sock, if you like, that goes over your leg with a, a pin that ratchets into the bottom. But they tend to be thicker casts and, and they need like a lot of lining and foam, which makes it really difficult to ride a motorbike because you can't bend your leg back as much. And you don't have as much mobility. So this, to me, is... a the best option it does have a tendency to come off theoretically you should be able to hang upside down but the reality is as you're moving it will it will come off do you have different legs for different activities yes like a turbo leg for riding your bike <laughs> well funnily enough i made a leg but you end up collecting bits and pieces and as technology advances when i first started trail riding one of the problems i had i'd wear motocross star boots or trail boots you have no normal leg you're not going to ankle or anything so there's a big air pocket inside your your boot well that air pocket becomes a water pocket when you start going through big puddles so then your boot then weighs about a million kilograms and starts to pull the leg off so that became a real issue i managed to get an old foot from somewhere that had a and it used to do one with a bit of a spring on it that sort of worked and i just super glued a sole off of a motocross boot and it's similar i have a thing similar thing for when i'm skiing i have a ski foot that goes straight into the the, the binding that worked really well you know, I run a charity and Instagram is everything, right? So it was good for the pictures because people could see it. But also when you're riding and people are, are aware of it. But I sort of migrated back to wearing boots. So I, what I always found, I'll always look at making modifications. And generally speaking, I'll go full circle, modification, modification, and now I'll come back to just a normal foot and go, just work with it. But you've got to go through that process. And I do that every single time, whether it's skiing, canoeing, motorcycling, whatever. You know, you go through that that process. But my favourite story about that, though, is when I was in Morocco. And one of the things that I know you guys have spoke about it. Noel, I know you speak about Morocco and we've got great love for the people there and the ingenuity. For the trip we did for the BBC and the first day I was riding with this leg and we did the first stop. And it'd been a couple of months since the road. So, you know, you know it's like you go get out for the first time. It's all gravelly tracks and you, you feel like you've never ridden before and got over that. And then the first morning, we'd had a great morning and they stopped for lunch. And I looked down and the sole had come off this foot. The thing is, the foot is carbon fibre. So it's shiny carbon fibre on a metal pen. So there's no grip at all. But I must have ridden for 10, 15, 20 miles, not aware of it. But then your mind screws you up because now you're going, that's going to slip off. And I, and I spent the rest of the day riding this thing and, and, and desperately nervous every time I stood up because my foot would slip off the peg. And I remember we got to the hotel that night, really late at night, 
made a massive mistake of deciding to do an extra leg and coming in in the darkness. And I went up to one of the mechanics that was working with us, a local, and I said, you know, have you got any masking tape or a, an inner tube? Any way I could sort of do something with this? And he said, well, what do you want? I said, well, what I want and what I can have is two different things. And, he, and then he grabs some poor guy, rips his flip-flop off his foot and goes like this. And he puts his flip-flop on the bottom and went, well, yeah, that would be great, right, you know. But we're literally in the middle of nowhere. And I said, well, if you're going to do that, can you make it about an inch and a half thicker? He went, yeah, yeah no problem. And then he chaps away to the, like, this guy who, who he gives him my leg, uh, jumps on a push bike and cycles into the darkness because at the time COVID was on. So there's loads of COVID restrictions. So no one was actually, it was a curfew. And he just disappears in my leg. By that time, I was too tired, shattered. I thought, if I never see that again, I'll never see that again. An hour and a half, two hours later, he comes back with this beautifully fashioned soul done by the most professional cobbler even my prosthesis couldn't do the same and he charged me you know pennies he wanted like five euros or something like that and to this day i still use that and it was one of those things where you just go we've lost that art in this country of mending and doing things and if you went to timpson's first of all the guy would look at me and go what you're talking about i can't do that or he'd tell me it's going to take three weeks or whatever it is and then was going to woke this guy up in the middle of the night who just did this amazing job. That was it. My love affair with Morocco was sealed. I guess the reason for me asking you about it, it doesn't seem to stop you from doing the stuff that you want to do. Bearing in mind the charity that you have, that must set a very good example to guys that are going through the process after they've lost a limb or several limbs in some cases. Hopefully it does to a certain extent. I think that comes back to the reason why I had an elective amputation in the first place. It was because I realised it was slowing me down. And I had a young son as well and I was like I was 40, 41 at the time and I didn't want to slow down. I didn't want to be filling my young son up of memories. I used to do this or I used to do that and when I was in the Marines, I did this and I used to jump out of airplanes or I used to ride motorcycles. I didn't want to be that person that talked about all the things you used to. Culminated actually into the ABR Festival this year. To spend a whole weekend riding on those trails with my son for the first time was just, apart from he annoyingly just wanted to keep going round and round and round faster and faster and faster. And I just wanted to sit down and have a beer. But that was the reason. And then the charity thing came later. You know, I was involved in a forerunner of a charity that had done the Dakar in cars. And I got involved with that, but they were demobilising. But I did get to go on a couple of car rallies, off-road driving rallies. And what I saw was actually the event itself was the background activity. And what they did when they did the Dakar, which was a great and amazing thing, and it did a lot for military charities and it did a lot for disabled people. In fact, they changed the rules for the Dakar before they did it you couldn't compete disabled. And now we've got quadriplegics driving trucks and stuff. But it was those guys that set the precedent and got a disabled guy across the finishing line. We took that mantle on and, you know, in that first year I was racing, we were the first pair to be disabled in a car. So I had two amputees driving the car, which had never been done in the UK. And then we won an event against able-bodied people and people went, oh, okay, this can be done and it is safe. The next year, I then took over, started to create Future Terrain, and I put two wheelchair users in a car, which had never been done before. And now it's like the idea of people dis disabled people driving and competing is just it's normal. So that was one of the first things that we sort of did. Going back to the reason why, and, and to the reason why I thought we went towards expeds rather than motorsport, was I very quickly understood that it wasn't the racing and the driving that was the real benefit that people were getting. It was being part of something. It was being part of getting the cars ready at the weekend, having a bit of camaraderie, being with like-minded people, people taking the piss of each other. You know, there is a graveyard humour that goes to the military that sometimes doesn't translate into other environments. But also the downtime in the evenings, all the sexy racing in the daytime and all the rest of it. But the ability to is sit down around the campfire and talk about problems and talk about bits and pieces. And especially for the people with the mental health injuries, I, I, all the people I've had with physical injuries, we can cater for really easy because it's bolting things on. It's putting levers and brake levers in different places. But the people with mental health injuries are a real challenge to, to look after because, you know, it's not as obvious. And not all people with physical injury have a mental injury as well. Sometimes get the same. So we flicked it on its head and decided that the expedition piece as well was important because it's fair to everybody. Whereas no matter what car driving team you're in, you only remember the driver, right? 
and whereas an expedition everyone's involved the prep's always the good bit isn't it even for a bike trip the prep is what gets me to near divorce we're having a bit of a fallow year this year and i was purposefully because there was lots of stuff going on with family so we've only done a couple of things this year but when we did fennec endeavor which was the last morocco trip when we, you know we took 24 disabled people two u.s veterans as well and we had everything from a triple amputee to a, a stage four ms sufferer a paraplegic and then a multitude of mental health injuries and limb loss you know on bikes and in atvs and that was a good 18 months in the planning politics involved because of sponsorship clashes and sponsor clashes and things like that but the risk assessment the managing of that insurances tr training people we're big on training people before we go anywhere it was a good 18 months of phone calls every night planning at weekends risk assessing getting access to training areas broughton boroughs is another area that we train on so the biggest sand dunes in the country on the christie estate they're very kind to us so we go and do some proper dirt bike training there and we use titch cormac to help train and things like that so the preparation is massive but it's important because things do go wrong and they did on the on the fennec on, on fennec endeavor you know was that the one my old colleague Peter Greaves was involved in. Was, yeah. If you don't know who Peter Greaves is, it's Petrol Ped on YouTube. He was possibly the best ever trainer that I've ever witnessed. That I work in corporate training. He was brilliant as a trainer and he's brilliant as a presenter and a YouTube guy. Well worth looking at his stuff if you're into cars. Yeah, he did a few things with us and we got to know him through Goodwood, the Goodwood Estate. And one of my trustees is a big off-road rally driver. He's a very hands-on trustee. So it's pretty much me and him that run the show. He's the money man. He goes out and gets the money and then I put the operational plan together and I always have to calm him down. I come up with a plan to do something and he always wants to turn it into Ben Hur, you know, and I'm trying to do some art house movie. So we get there somewhere in the middle. But yeah, having petrol pen along it's fantastic i'm not very good at social media we have a social media presence we're a small charity right there's pretty much three people that run it a treasurer myself and a, a trustee we have a, a board of trustees but they, they're not actively involved no one gets paid no one even takes expenses every penny that comes in goes back out again it takes up a lot of time the time you need to dedicate to social media to do it properly and we took petrol ped on a an expedition it was a, this was a car-based expedition during covid so we were meant to go to the pyrenees and then the pyrenees became if you remember a red zone for covid and then i had some really good beneficiaries that i really wanted to look after and i said well we can't do it but are you still up for doing something and they said, yeah, and I had about six weeks to come up with a UK-based exped. So we started at Bovington. We got, brought Titch Cormac in. We did loads of training and Petrol Ped came along and filmed that. We were sponsored as well by the time at that time by Dacia Cars UK. So it was a really good opportunity for them. And we did a green laning around Dorset. Then we did, give, gave them blind road books so they wouldn't know where they were going. That's follow road books. And then we, we took them to Broughton Borough. So we did sand driving, dune driving, and then up to North Wales. So a friend of mine is the founder and CEO for the Zip World. And he's got some amazing quarries. So we were doing quarry driving and, and Petrol Ped came along and that. And he's just so good at creating that video content. And, and you see the work that goes into it. When we took him out to Fennec, so he came on the BBC trip that we did. When he came out on that, he just didn't stop. He's either positioning cameras, he's doing a face-to-camera shot, he's interviewing somebody. And then every evening, as soon as he's got internet, he's editing videos, an impressive work ethic. And he comes up with very good videos that are very long that people are actually watch all the way through. You know, people's attention spans aren't very good. He did his, some great videos for uh, that actually probably told a better story than the BBC episode did on Speed Shop. Can we just talk a bit about Future Terrain and, and how it began? Was it a slow evolution? It was. Like I say, I got involved with another charity that was doing the Dakar piece and I... I thought, oh, great. That was it. That was the, the, the draw. But they were really demobilizing. They'd just done two Dakars and they were demobilizing. So we did a bit of driving, but that's where I had the brainchild to go. They had a lot of assets and they had a bit of a momentum going and people involved. We had nothing in the bank. We had about 200 quid in the bank. And I took it on. I said, right, I'll take this on. But I just wanted to change the name because I wanted to change the, the legacy. And I wanted to invert because when you're looking at going to Dakar, we, you know how expensive Dakar is. But to take the four cars and the truck that they took last time, it was about £1.5 million, pounds, right? You know, but this is in the days of big corporate sponsors. Afghanistan, Iraq was big in the news. People were willing to get behind it. But I get it. You know, 
things change, flavor of months changes, and it's not a sustainable model. And to do all, spend all that money to get one person across the finishing line is great if you're a big corporate or racing team. But And don't get me wrong, it did a lot to demonstrate the plight of wounded soldiers and veterans and people like that, but it, it had its place in time. I tried to invert the model. Bang for buck is our thing, so do more with less money. So we did a bit of local racing, rallying, and then it used to be a thing called the British National Cross Country Championships we took part in. They were really, really pro what we were doing i built a little race team and then i would run a car as well but invite people along so they come as a passenger especially with people with mental health injuries so we could drive as fast or as slow as they wanted to i wasn't being under the pressure of racing if they really wanted to go fast we'll go fast we'll drive their own competing if they suddenly say i'm out of here i just pull off and that model worked really well because you could get 20 people through in a weekend and give them an experience but as i said the more i saw that what we were doing in the evening sat down people exchanging stories you know even if it was just practical advice i'm having real problems with prosthetic have you tried this have you spoken to this person that kind of thing or people just being able to feel comfortable that they could speak about problems that they were having that was when we said you know future terrain and the name future terrain came from when we we started to get into proper certified training for cars atvs and uh quad bikes and one of the terms we use when we're training is look at the future terrain the future terrain is the ground before you and that was a term we used so it's all about doing constant risk assessment you know you're doing this dynamic risk assessments all the time we have these little sayings as we go along and we were always saying keep an eye on the future terrain like actually bode well with your own personal future train what is your future train what are the obstacles you need to get over and that was sort of like the uh evolution if you like, or the genesis of this we landed a really good sponsorship deal with Dacia UK and we went out to do what was a large Moroccan rally, road car rally, the Carter Rally it's called, which does hold sections of the old Dakar that goes through Morocco. And we turned up in these Dacia dusters, right? We properly prepared them. I drove a brand new Dacia duster from the UK all the way to southern Morocco in one go. I had 200 miles on the clock when I left. It had six and a half thousand on it when we got back 10 days later. I drove it all the way down there, took part in the Carter Rally and drove it back. Dacia UK and Renault were just over the moon. That sat outside their HQ offices uncleaned for about a month. Grant, I've got a duster, so I'm interested to know how reliable was it? Uh, absolutely great. And I'm not just saying that. They're not our sponsors anymore, so I can say that. We went out there. We probably spent, with massive discount, dealer discount, about £7,000 on spares and didn't use any. We came from a world of bowler wildcats, if you know what they are, proper expensive cars rover v8s dakar proven blah 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 and all the people that used to work with us going you're not going to last five minutes the clutch you'll burn the clutches out you'll trash everything you'll you'll be breaking half shafts every five minutes so we took about half a ton of half shafts and prop shafts and everything else the only thing we did don't know why we didn't do this and this was a mistake we didn't take any spare radiators we hold a radiator on the first day doing all the rad weld and bits and pieces we turned up at this car to rally you can imagine trophy trucks proper full-on rally cars we were a novelty we turned up and then it was like the the league that we were in all of a sudden we were second and third after the first day and people got oh, hang about and now there's people in these fully fully equipped hiluxes and stuff like that and then every day we were we were podiumed and then we did a night section and we had two nutters that two beneficiaries that were, we let loose that night and they came in something like the top 10 in this Dacia Duster. And that was probably more to do with their madness than anything else. But it performed brilliantly. Body shells are made of cheese. We lost a load of the inner liners of the, the first day. All the liners and all the stuff underneath we lost. They performed brilliantly. And like I say, but the, my favourite one, and I've only just sold it. I drove it all the way there. Did the, the rally, drove it all the way back, and it didn't miss a beat. I wish you hadn't said that, because, dear listener, if you could see Noel's smug fucking face now. Oh, I've got another bargain, brilliant car. <laughs> but no, they're really good cars. Got a Europe. Every third car is yeah. a decent Yeah, Duster, massive, yeah. massive in Europe. But they're off-road credentials. I mean, it's a Nissan X-Trail running gear. It's got a Renault Clio engine. They use components from previous cars that are tried and tested. You only get, even down to their brake sensors, are ones that have been, they've been using for three or four years. So reliability is through the roof. So if you want to watch a couple of these expeditions, check out Petrol Ped's YouTube channel. And also on iPlayer, you've got the Morocco expedition. On I think it's episode two of Titch McCormack's Speed Shop series. I don't want to talk about cars too much. My influence was to bring bikes into the party, much against my trustees' advice, because they're scared to death of them. When we did the Fennec Endeavour, we had 
an injury every day. One thing that always sticks in my mind, Clive, you were trying to organise some riding or something, and you said, look, everyone come in, you said, oh, I need to make sure that people sign a waiver and no, you're like, no, everyone's got the responsible for their own. And when you do a charity and take disabled people into the desert, this is our waiver. It's 11 pages long. I do this for free. I don't want to get sued because I've killed somebody. To your point, Noel, earlier you said about the preparation. We really drill into this. We were asked to do the, what we called it Fennec Endeavour, was the exped to Morocco. We were asked to do that by the chairman of the Invictus Games, who is a big enduro rider. And every year he takes a load of mates out and they do it. But it's different when you're all mates and you're paying yourself and paying your, signing your own waiver. But when you're delivering this for free and all the stuff we do, we raise the money and the, the beneficiaries don't pay a penny. Ironically, it puts more emphasis on you because you're actually properly in on this. You know, So we just make sure we're pretty watertight on the waivers and stuff. The guy who asked us to do this event, he got quite hacked off with us because we were um, doing so much risk assessment stuff, so much work on this. And we wanted to see the insurance and we get a legal team to look for it. And he said, you're taking the joy out of this. And we said, no, no, the point is do this now. And then when we're out on the ground, when things go horribly wrong, you can sit pretty and that was the case i mean you know you see on the on the bbc program a guy called gordon todd came off within 45 minutes broken arm broken leg you know and that was first day second day we had a guy we thought was having a heart attack it's actually magnesium depletion we were 38 kilometers away from the nearest road and then we had the next day a a guy broke 11 ribs and each one of these was a major kazavak was that first crash was that a fairly slow speed off that was a guy who's not very experienced at all. We'd risk assessed everybody. We took them to Broughton Boroughs. There's a guy, Stan Watts. I don't know if you know Stan Watts. He's a bit of a Dakar legend, British rider. He rides under the Irish banner, but he's a former Royal Marine as well. Great guy. And he runs a, a school down in uh, Dorset, again, near Bovington, actually. Does some great stuff. And he's a brilliant rider. And he's done the Dakar loads of times. We got him and a team of guys to come down and just run everybody through the paces on the bikes. This guy in particular was one guy we were worried about. And even funnily enough, he hadn't got injuries. <laughs> he, was a, he was a guy who came along and he was just struggling a little bit with life. Once they got mental health issues, he needed a break. And we, we sort of took him on. And then we smashed him up in about 45 <laughs> minutes. And But that's when it all works. You know, we had injured people that were medics. We had a, a girl who who'd had a major stroke and head injury who's now an A&E nurse. So she was there. We had another guy with a back injury who was blown up in Afghan who was a, a medic. And so they're straight on the scene. We Kazavaked him out. The insurances work because we tested them. The whole process was there. And we even, to a certain extent, we worked out that what was his recovery time going to be? He wasn't earning a lot of money. We worked out what his statutory benefits were and we managed to give him a small grant to get him through it because we didn't want him to do no harm. You know, So we took some money out of our accounts and and, and brought him back to where he was. But that doesn't happen unless you do all that planning and that boring stuff of pouring through the, the, the paperwork to make sure it's going to work. It may come as something of a surprise to our listeners that I, I can be a little bit cynical at times, Grant. That evening, we uh, sat around talking, the group of people that we're in Team Tam podcast. So there's probably about, I don't know, 10, 12 people there or something. So we've got you and your mate, a couple of ex-military veterans. We had an A&E doctor. We had a quite a senior copper. I was kind of out of the conversation at this point. People were sharing stories about the stuff they've had to do as part of their job. I ended up getting quite emotional because it was just like, you know, you know, you get, oh, thank you for your service. And you just think, oh, fuck off. That's fake. But you know what? I left... <laughs> left that event thinking those people do so much and go through so much and see so much that we don't have to deal with it right i came back with um you know even at the ripe old age of 50 something a real appreciation and, and a gratitude for the for the kind of stuff people people in the services do that's very kind of you clive but also it's great fun what can people do? Can we donate cash? Do you want old DRZ parts chucked through the letterbox? As many old DRZ parts as you can throw, because I can get through <laughs> We get a lot of our money either from corporate sponsors. We're not very good at shaking the tin, because that takes a lot of time and effort, unless you're throwing resources at it. And again, we don't really have the time for that. So we generally look at corporate sponsorship but not big stuff so what we tend to find is when we get the begging bowl out and we'll be doing that in the early in the year because we're looking to go back to morocco next year we go out with the begging bowl and we approach a few smaller businesses to say you know do you want to throw some money in what we really really appreciate is working alongside partnering 
with businesses that can provide us with stuff because we usually need money to buy stuff. So it's actually better if people give us stuff or give us a really heavy discount. So that tends to be the model going back out to Morocco next year on bikes, ATVs, quad bikes, things like clothing. It's things like protective gear, that kind of stuff we try to partner with, you know, and if anyone's out there that feels obliged or it, it, it flicks their switch and they want to get involved, no matter how big or how small they are, we really appreciate it. And we get a lot of our money as well from some of the large charities. So a lot of charities are grant giving charities. We've become a bit of a trusted delivery arm now for a couple of the bigger charities, British Limited Sex Servicemen's Association, the Veterans Lottery. They see that what we do, they see the return on what we do. They've learned now that if they give us a thousand pounds, that thousand pounds only gets spent on doing what we do. We're lucky enough to be based out of the reservist centre, so we don't have to have to pay to put the lights on. So no wage bill, no utilities bill. Our biggest outlays are our lantra qualifications each year. That's our teaching qualifications for off-road driving skills and everything else. And our insurance, which is not massive at the moment, but with the insurance bill for going away is usually a big lump. The results of what you do are very tangible. Having watched that film today, you know, it's very tangible just from a, a sort of a brief observation of it. But what are the results that you see as a result of people going on these trips? It varies. It varies with different people. We have some people that return all the time. We always try to provide some vocational training that goes along with that. So we certify everyone. To be honest, the vocational bit is an happy accident. It's really for our own risk. Asset. Someone says, you took these guys into the desert. How do you know that we're going to perform? Well, they're all certified 4 by 4 drivers or ATV operators and things like that. So that's part of the, the risk assessment program. And, and our delivery the well-being aspect of it is probably the best bit and that's difficult it's a difficult thing to measure we do the, all the great stuff you know feedback surveys and everything else but every now and again you get a a little nugget we took a guy on the last exped who's a bilateral amputee above knee lost loads of fingers on one hand you know a tragic story passed sandhurst officer joined the, the army I think he was like two weeks straight out to Afghanistan, two weeks as an army officer and got blown up, career over. And this guy is a bright guy, right? He's a Sandhurst officer, university educated. But he came on and did our four by four course. And he said, that's the first time I've done something where I've needed to pass a pass a qualification. And it's an easy qualification, right? It's designed for farm laborers and everything. He said, you won't believe the lift that gave me to get a certificate. Funnily enough, when we first started doing this, when you go to some of the bigger charities and with your begging bowl, they say, what are your aims of your charity? And sometimes it, it, it sounds easy, but sometimes it's difficult to articulate. And we always rounded on the well-being aspect, the feeling of well-being that prepares people then to launch into the next stage of their life. And it was almost ridiculed. Seven years, eight years ago, it was ridiculed. What do you mean you don't give money away or you don't give wheelchairs away or you don't do... No, we don't do any of that. We just make people feel good. And it was ridiculed. But now... The first question they ask is, what are you doing to support people's well-being and mental health? And I was saying we were, we were sort of right from the start. It's not easy to measure, but every now and again, we get a nugget that comes through. Because you can come away from these experts and go, was that successful? No one died. And then what you tend to find is you get a letter from someone's wife. We had a letter from someone's wife who's saying he came back a different man. He came back and he decorated the lounge. And I've been asking him to do that for three years. We had a sad story. We had a guy that we really didn't think we'd benefited because he seemed to complain all the time about everything that we're offering and that gets a bit frustrating when you're hang on, we're taking you on this world changing trip and you're complaining about the eggs aren't quite cooked in the middle of the desert and, and complained and complained and complained and we thought well we'll never see and we had we had a couple of issues and we had to discipline him a couple of times because of his behavior because it wasn't acceptable and and we come back we go you know we didn't do that guy any favors at all he didn't do us any favors and then tragically he was a motorbike nut and tragically, he was killed out on his R1, T-boned, uh, and was killed. And word got back to us. The family reached out and just said, we just want to thank you because in the last couple of years of his life, all he ever talked about was that trip he went away on. And we sent him loads of pictures and videos, the stuff that we haven't put on, on Instagram because you have loads of stuff, but some crappy photographs, but he was in them. And then he's suddenly going, yeah, it does make a difference. Even if it's not obvious. We ask ourselves this all the time. And when we think we're not doing any good anymore or we're not required, we'll stop doing what we're doing. But it seems to be that every time it, it lands well, you know, there's at least one nugget. We have a success story or a, a, of every trip. Well, I think as bikers and as people that do go on these adventures, every time you come back from something, you come back with a kind of a new lease of life. No, we went out for like three hours on Saturday and I came back a different person just from having a little run out <laughs> around the tails. <laughs> Lots of people say that having spent time, even a brief time with me. Coming back to mindfulness, right? Certainly for me. I am concentrating like Billy O when I'm on the on the trails just to survive and stay upright. But that's so refreshing. You're in the moment, right? I took 
So a guy around uh, the Bobbington training area on, on a rally. And this guy is probably the only person I've really seen who's got the physical manifestation of PTSD. You know, if you look at these old First World War black and white videos of the people shaking, and he literally was physically shaking. And he'd not only just got PTSD, but he's divorced. You get to know people very quickly when you're sat in a rally car next to him waiting for the, the light to go green. And he was the one guy who just, he went from a shaking mess to calm as you like. As we went round, you okay? And he went, no, that was amazing. Let's go again, but faster. And he was calm as you like, because he was just in that moment. It wasn't being bombarded by demons or anything else. And, I, you know, and that was when the penny starts to drop about, it's not actually about racing. It's not actually about doing this. It's not actually about looking good on a motorbike. It's about, that. I like say, that being in the moment and doing something and challenging yourself. Because we all, I do anyway now, I have a sedentary job, sat at the desk looking at a laptop all day. It is challenging. But to get out on a bike and just get dirty and scare yourself a little bit, get a bit dirty, get a bit uncomfortable, it's just amazing what that can do for you. I think that's a really good place to stop. Other than to say, we do know we have a number of suppliers of motorcycles, tyres, clothing, or listen to this podcast. If you want uh, Grant's contact details, just uh, drop me a note and I'll put you in touch. I'm a little bit lost for words to what to say after that episode and that conversation with grant other than if you do know somebody or you are able to support future terrain in some way then reach out to grant at futureterrain.co.uk or give me a shout and i can put you in touch with him let's see if we can help continue the great work that he and others like him are unselfishly doing all right see you next time Thanks for listening. We really appreciate your support. Don't forget you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you really appreciate what we do, you could consider supporting us on Patreon or buy us a coffee. Links are available on our website, which is tampodcast.com, tampodcast.com, where we also have a limited selection of branded stuff. But either way, please keep listening and spreading the word. See you next time. (laughs) 